welcome you to this service of worship on this uh, day when we remember uh, Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. Our call. The Lord be with you. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high, just as were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human resemblance, and his form beyond that of mortals, so that he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. I invite you to sing with me two verses of Were You There? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, oh, oh. Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there? pray. All merciful God, you did not spare your only Son, but offered him up for us all, that he might bear our sins upon the cross. Grant that we might so examine ourselves, that we realize our own sinfulness, so great as to spiritually crucify him anew. Help us to recognize the ways in which we deny Christ still today. May we be transformed into more faithful disciples in his name. Amen. We're going to have a series of readings. I'm thankful for those who offered to help out on this Good Friday service. Mark 14, 32 to 36. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved. Even to death, remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. A reading from Mark 14, 43 to 46. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there were, was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given him, them a sign, saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. Beneath the cross of Jesus. Beneath the cross of Jesus, 
I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. A home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way. From the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. I take, O oh cross, your shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss. My sinful self, my only shame, my glory of the cross. Reading Mark 14, verses 66 to 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl on seeing him began again to say in the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Our hymn, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find Rest beyond the river. Near the cross I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand just beyond the river. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Jesus must be killed. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to them, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin.
Is it finished? The readings from this day talk about why Christ came. You notice that the reading where Jesus says, Isn't, is it finished, hasn't been read yet. John is the one that uses that phrase. He was emphasizing that Jesus didn't see himself as a victim of a cruel political system. To see Christ only as a victim is to ignore the many warnings that he gave his disciples of his suffering and death. Even Thomas Aquinas called Christ savior victim in the sense of his sacrifice opening the gates of life to humanity. Steen wrote about it this way, there has been a victory and the world's redemption has been achieved. The divine purpose has been accomplished. Humanity has been sought and found and the forces of death and sin and evil and suffering have been forever broken. The story that we've been reading betrays a sense of Jesus' victory. In meeting with Pilate, Jesus presents himself as a royal figure, though different than the idea of a ruler that Pilate had. Pilate was clearly looking for a way out of a complex problem. Philip Brooks wrote this way about Jesus. We cannot surely overestimate the great importance and clearness of the fact that Jesus looked himself for the most mighty results to issue from his dying. The great importance which for the Christian church was given to that event has only echoed the infinite estimate he set upon it. He was always pointing forward to it before it came. He met it with the most awful reverence when it arrived. And with the last gasp of his closing agony, he announced the completion as if it were the work of the world that had been finished. The question for us today is much the same that the early church tried to answer. Is it finished? Is the death of Jesus on our behalf all that can be said and done? I don't believe so. Jesus' death was an atoning sacrifice, making us one with God. But Jesus didn't even mean for his sacrifice to be the end of all human care. In our Lenten reflection, we examine our lives because we believe that what we say and do has an impact on the world in which God has placed us. To believe that Christ's death is the final statement about God's acceptance is to deny our part in being witness to Christ's saving act. God has called us out. It was Henry David Thoreau who wrote, if a person does not keep pace with one's companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music he hears however measured or far away. Good Friday is a time to ask ourselves whose drumbeat we step to. Is it the work of Christ finished in our lives? If we are thinking about God's grace and Jesus' saving power, then we want to answer yes. If we could have been saved in some other way, then the cross was a big mistake in Christ's life. In fact, I've read that there's a sect of Islam, a conservative branch, which believed that Jesus was taken down from the cross before death, revived and sent away to Kashmir to live a long and prosperous life. But if Jesus had escaped the cross, there would be no Christian religion. That's why the Gospels and letters emphasize that Jesus truly died and was buried. Our faith is centered around it. On the other hand, 
when we think about Jesus' mission in life and the work that he left for his disciples, then we have to answer no. The work of Christ is not finished in our lives. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus knelt before his disciples, washed their feet, and told them to be in the world as servants. In his book, Once Upon a Tree, Calvin Miller wrote these words. Is it not time to raise the cross in the middle of our lives? We must be careful before we answer it. His cross will not coexist with our present way of life. We must not raise the cross, yet ignore it in all our petty social involvements. Once we salute it momentarily, we must serve it hourly for the rest of our lives. The cross is the supreme example of righteousness and can never belong to the person who will not show it supreme respect. We take comfort in knowing that God is not removed from his creation. Jesus came and experienced life so that we can know that our problems are not foreign to him. When we face suffering in life, we have the story of Good Friday turning to Easter, which fills us with hope. We don't know how bad our suffering may get or even what form Easter may take in our lives. But we do know one thing. We know Jesus, who prayed for God's deliverance, knew death, and experienced new life. Because of Christ's obedience, we can look for a day when eternal salvation is ours. Is it finished? In our living, we answer that question. Philip Brooks put it so well. The great Easter truth is not that we are to live newly after death, but that we are to be new here and now by the power of the resurrection. Not so much that we are to live forever as that we are to live nobly now because we are to live forever. Thanks be to God. Join with me now in singing, O come and mourn with me a while. Verses 1 and 4. O come and mourn with me a while. O come now to the Savior's side. O come together, let us mourn. Jesus, our love, is crucified. O love of God, O sin-filled world, in this dread act your strength is tried, and victory remains with love. Jesus, our love is crucified. Jesus is killed. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fill what scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And what is and that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus with his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing beside her, 
he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciples, Here is your mother. And from that hour on, the disciples took her into their own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of the hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 